MPB is the largest global platform to buy, sell and trade used photo and video kit. MPB is the simple, safe and circular way to trade, upgrade and get paid for kit. Find out more at www.mpb.com. Um, well, this is uh, the AV Forums Movies Podcast special and we've got with us Jasper Sharp. Um, so, Jasper, what's your background in AV? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your current title, your role, and what you're doing with Arrow. Right. Well, I am a disc producer at Arrow Films. I've been with the company about three years, working full time. Um, and before that, I did a bit of um, freelance production work for them on the Sage and Suzuki box sets, such as the Taisho trilogy and the... Uh, Young Sage and Suzuki boxes one and two, but um, my background basically goes back a lot further than that. As a writer, uh, film critic, and curator, I set up in 1999, 2000 with Tom Mez, uh, the website Midnight Eye. Uh, so that's my passion is Japanese cinema. Um, and uh, from then on, you know, I was living in Tokyo for a while. Um, Big fan of Japanese films, came back to England around about 2005 and was doing a lot of um, curation from that point and ended up working for Raindance Film Festivals, then setting up my own film festival um, all the time writing, published a couple of books on Japanese film. Um, and I, when I was in Japan, I also uh, filmed a few extras for a company called Arts Magic, if you remember them back in 2003, um, interviews with uh, Takashi Miike for the various DVD releases from the beginning of the uh, new millennium. And with Joji Ida, I, I filmed the interview for um, Razen or Spiral, the uh, yeah. Ring sequel. Mm -hmm. So I mean, really all this background. Oh, I also made a film, a documentary called uh, The Creeping Garden with um, Tim Grabham which is a feature length documentary on slime mold. So I have a sort of film production background as well. So basically from curation, writing, editing sort of uh, books and, and websites and and um, knowing people in the industry, I, I guess I sort of have these, this is a sort of our ideal job for me where all my skills sort of come together, really. Right. And so you landed at Arrow, producing some of their um i mean i i'm guessing from some of the the di titles that you've covered mm. predominantly japanese releases yeah i mean i was um i started at arrow full time sort of right at the beginning of the pandemic there were a couple of people that left and and there was a the shortfall in in house producers then so i was doing some sort of um freelance stuff I think I was working on Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence and the Hiroshima release at the time. And um, yeah, then they said, come in and work full time. And, you know, obviously pandemic was a fairly insecure time for everyone. So it, it was perfect timing from my point of view. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's where my, my passion lies, but not exclusively. And I'm actually finding it quite fun working on a lot of the stuff outside the Japanese films as well. You know, give me a chance to spread my wings. Yes, I can see that. Yes. So, so as a disc producer, at least the work you do do with Arrow, how do you decide what sort of titles you'd be involved in? Are they are they given to you, or do you do you get to cherry pick the ones that really interest you and then deep dive into them? Well, it's generally a case of like um, all of the big studios will have their lists of availabilities or, or you know, there'll be suggestions that, you know, um, our team will brainstorm together and go, what should this, sort of stuff should we pick up from this particular company? I mean, I can do that pretty well with the Japanese stuff, thinking, oh, this, you know, the, these films will, I want to see released. Um, it's all based on what's available, really. Um, but um, after they've been acquired I think it's generally a sort of you know who wants to work on this title a sort of snatch and grab sort of scenario and uh generally it works out fine I can't think of anything you know if you get stuff that you 
are not that keen on generally you make yourself keen on doing them but uh <laughs> you know there might, be, there might be films obviously that you really would love to work on that someone else gets and that that's always a slight and, case that wasn't really happening uh, though. you're generally quite happy with uh, how it's been partitioned up i can see that oh, did, did you fantastic. pick battle royale yeah that was actually one that had been licensed before i came on board yeah and uh my initial thoughts i remember yeah they said oh do you want to work on this as a freelancer and my initial thoughts were oh my god not another release of battle royale it's such a new film and then i just sort of looked back and went it's actually not a new film is it it's, 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 go show how old i am because i remember i was in rotterdam when it when it first got its european premiere and and um mm. that was like 2001 i think it was yeah it was early 2001 and i remember like those of people just storming out of the cinema in protest and uh, um but you know that is a long time ago you know i remember when it was just about to get the premiere in the uk and then 9 11 hit you know just, yes. sort of on the day, literally the day it was meant to open yeah. so that's what was sort of interesting so i think probably a lot of the people coming if they didn't have that close relationship with the film might not have, would have overlooked these that sort of aspect of it you know it was a yeah. sort of turning point film or came at a very very much a turning point with how foreign films and and violence was consumed i think in, in the uk and what was acceptable in, in films yes yes definitely well i mean it was a it was very influential and and i remember i mean it's a bunch of kids who are killing each other but i remember the thinking when i first came across hunger games how much of a sanitized kind of US version was. I'm all, I was almost aghast that they had so taken ideas wholesale from this and then turned it into a young adult variation. Such a um, poor variation. Yeah, well, yeah I, mean... I, I did actually go back and watch Hunger Games again just to, I mean, there's obviously quite a lot of, I mean, it's, Battle Royale itself is hardly the sort of beacon of originality, but I guess what, what it was was like sort of, um, you know, that uh, most dangerous game sort of mm. yes. done with, with hyperbolic yeah. levels of gore, which you had in Turkey Shoot before, and, and I guess it's it's hardly unique, but I think... But with kids... Hunger Games, but so with it, kid, but with kids made it yeah a little bit, no know. it's it's true isn't it yeah yeah so sort of lord of the flies meets sort of most dangerous game meets yeah. sort of friday the 13th level of <laughs> gore basically um yeah i mean hunger games was a bit i mean but i think the thing that struck me when watching hunger games was just how incredibly dull it was <laughs> <laughs> and obviously it cost more to make than battle royale but it didn't seem you were getting more you know bang for your buck no no not at all <laughs> It's so, so, so interesting, Jasper. With your background in mm -hmm. uh, Asian cinema, we're here predominantly because your latest film is uh, uh, is from a hell of a lot further west, shall we say? It's yeah. in Spain, and, and it's it's the house that screamed. So, so how and why did you pick that title to work on? Oh yeah, well that was. Um, I mean, I I was weaned on horror movies. I grew up in the eighties doing on the on the tape trading the um, circuit. So basically, Euro horror sort of getting the nth generation dupes of, of various Jallo titles and Argento films. You know, that's where I nurtured my um, sort of film education. Um, but then you see, I sort of went out of. Uh, I sort of fell out of love with horror for a while. Mm -hmm. I think I just fell out of love with film in general for like, you know, and I was more interested in traveling around and, and my interest in Asian cinema, Japanese cinema mm. was more an adjunct of like me wanting to go to Japan and sort of watching a lot of Japanese films right. because I wanted to know about the culture. Um, but when, when House of Scream came out on the list, so I remember looking at the title going, it sounds familiar. What is it? And, and then, realizing that it was La Residencia, the, the mm. Spanish title. And this was a film I'd, I'd read a lot about and, and had never seen in my life. So I, and I have this book, you know, the uh, Phil Hardy's Aurum Encyclopedia of Horror. Do you know that book? Uh, I've, I've, I've not seen it, but I've heard it mentioned okay. on for lots of hallowed of a, pages. Mm, people of a certain generation, you know, it, it was their Bible. I mean, it was yeah. the first, the book that first ever covered exhaustively, you know, the films of Jean Rallin or Jess Franco, just anything. So, I mean, certainly when I was about 
16 to 18, I think I made it my mission to try and watch every single film <laughs> in, that, in that book and, and actually succeeded, you know, to, to a degree. I probably got to about at least, you know, I don't know, half to two thirds maybe. Yeah. Um, but I think the residential was one I I hadn't seen but was certainly aware of. And, and I do remember reading about it um, and it's saying that it was really misogynistic and it was a sort of a bit of a throwaway review of it um but i just thought well you know this is a film that you know that there's context here there's stuff mm. to to research around it and it's that that sort of research process is really interesting in its own right um and you know what with the the, the world of the internet and and knowing people who the camera people or editors or translators overseas it's fairly easy to reach out and see who you can get you know to interview and, and bolster the package together yeah um yeah i'm trying to think when, when i finally did get to see it actually i i um was actually flabbergasted because it is such a good film and it was a film i, I don't think i ever appreciated how good it could be because you know i go back and you know obviously watching a lot of the stuff that you love when you're a teenager you go back yeah. and Zombie Holocaust. Well, it was sort of fun when you're 18, <laughs> but you know. So I was surprised that um yeah, yeah, the house had screamed. I mean, it is mm. just an astonishingly well-made, big budget, well acted, beautifully atmospheric film. And and for mm. me, it was just like, oh, I don't care how many times I have to watch this in the course of doing this job. It just looks gorgeous. <laughs> oh, fan- fantastic. So now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. Your job, <laughs> you've got the title. It, mm-hmm. it, it's yours. Can you take us through at a, at a sort of a very high level how you go about day one? You are handed the film to then producing the disc. Sort of what what is what is your role? What is the role of a disc producer? Can you just sort of give us a give us a snapshot into that? It sounds because it must be fast. I mean, for me. It sounds absolutely fascinating, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear what it what it is goes into it. Yeah, I sort of love it actually. It's it's like being a you know a producer where you literally you can have all the ideas and get everyone else to do the work and nice. just <laughs> within the budget <laughs> make sure that they do it. Um, I should say that in terms of like the technical aspects of it, you know, we we get the masters supplied. This was a uh, license from MGM. Uh, and the, the originally it was just the American language cuts was licensed. Okay. Um, but then we thought, well, you know, that there, there is a longer Spanish cut, um, and the the longer Spanish cut still is missing footage that's in the English cut. So about how how to combine them. Uh, so, but really, that was the the job. Once we'd established we we're doing that, that's the job mm-hmm. of the tech team. That's um, James White and James Percy were yep. working with, um, you know, doing the restorations and and also contacting uh, the Spanish uh, labs to get the Spanish footage uh, restored mm-hmm. as well. Making sure it all joined, making sure that you know, once you've put when you put everything together, sort of Frankenstein like a bit like that, you you end up with like the so the audio and the longer dub might be missing a few seconds here or there yeah. so you've got to account for all these little things and thank god that that wasn't my job you know <laughs> <laughs> but um i like to start generally uh with the artwork and i think you you always have a few ideas who do you want to get involved and and i actually had quite a long long um time to work on this title because originally it was planned for probably about a year ago, but then it became apparent that it was going to take a while for the master right. to, to get restored. Uh, so, you know, starting with the artwork, but then it was a case with, we've got all this time, who who can we get in Spain? Who, I, I definitely wanted Spanish critics, you know, I wanted yeah. um, or sp- uh, Spanish voices rather than just have this sort of punditry from outside. Uh, so um you know we have even the, down to the commentary you know Anna Bugat Sky did the commentary I mean she yeah. is Spanish so knew about the film but um also getting uh the director of Anna's uh Serrador's son um to talk about his father's work because I I met someone at Sitges Film Festival who said he knew his son quite well Excellent. um we ideally would have liked to get possibly more of the actresses but you know it's always a case where people sort of go missing in action uh yeah. over the years 
uh, and who else? Oh, the screenwriter. And I should say, I um, I have a, a friend, Eugenio Urculani, the Italian friend who yeah. who helped me um, put put me in touch with a few people that could help in Spain for that. Excellent. Excellent. So, so it really is a case of marshalling the troops, isn't it? You've got your tech team over there, mm. and in terms of the extras that you talked about, there are are they? It, it, it sounds like it's it's you driving that, not a case of oh well, let's see what's already out there and taking legacy features here and there. It, well, I mean, you you always go back and look at the old releases and then say, well, can we use that? Is there any point in doing that again if it's already been done, or should we get something else? And um, certainly, we we looked at um, well, I think it was the the screen release. We we've carried over the Mary Maud interview from that uh, on stage, but. Um, it was sort of interesting, actually, because prior to that, I just um, produced the three Fassbinder box sets, and I worked very closely with a guy in Germany, Robert Fischer, uh, who was making a lot of the extras, filming a lot of the extras. But um, I think I just dropped into conversation that I was working on House That Screamed, and he goes, oh, I've got an interview with John Mulder Brown sitting unedited anyway. I just <laughs> filmed him just because he was he's a friend, and I thought I'd film him. And so that that luckily came together. Oh, wow. just, just we didn't actually have to send him out to to film him. So that was very good. Oh, fantastic! So so in terms of the in terms of the house at screen, then what was the most challenging aspect of the entire release for you? <laughs> Probably keeping under budget, basically. <laughs> uh, just you know, it's always a problem I have, anyways. But uh, yeah, just. Yeah thinking you know what can you do and while you're planning one thing you know you never know if it's going to come off but once you set it in motion you're sort of committed to paying for it almost yeah so that's the problem if something you can't just go out and go well let's go and interview all these people contact them all and and then uh suddenly realize that you everyone says yes and it's like oh damn double I, gone over budget <laughs> I, I suppose that's where you've got to really re rein in the raining the fan <laughs> in yourself isn't it and the well i was going to say that the, the, with the battle royale um it was sort of lucky that that was done during covid times because i got slightly obsessed doing research <laughs> it and then managed to work out where all the the kids from it were there were quite a few i mean most of them haven't gone into acting at all but there was uh, one of the girls was like had become this is bizarre i found her on twitter as she was like a a compare commentator for this weird all animal wrestling um <laughs> tournament where people dress up in sort of tiger suit what onesies or, or dress up as godzilla and do this wrestling and it's a bit of a, a weird cult thing in japan apparently that should be your next release i want to <laughs> see that <laughs> and another one had become a sort of celebrity hairdresser so it was weird they, they'd all gone wow. on to different things you know i mean they're all like sort of Pushing forty now, all these kids mm. in battle royale. I mean the Fantastic. the battle royale box set. I would say, as a fan, mm -hmm. when I when I got that, I got that to review. I thought to myself, this is what I would want for every release ever. You know, <laughs> someone's come along and they've gone right. We're gonna we're gonna do battle royale. We're gonna do both cuts. Mm. We're going to do Battle Royale 2, which was hampered by the loss of the director and it, the, the limited footage that he'd already done and the takeover of the director's son and, the, you know, a lot of things. But we're going to do both cuts on that as well. And then we're going to turn it into, like, I think a five-disc set with <laughs> a boatload of features. And we'll just give you the soundtrack as well. I mean, as a fan, you're sitting there going... I want it for every every movie I like, because mm. Battle Royale is a little bit niche, but someone has gone, this someone out there really loves this, so this is what I'm going to give someone who loves it. So, so I suppose I'm interested because you're the person who did all of that. I mean, you might not have done the grading and the you know the produced the actual you know video, mm. but you have put it all together. I commissioned the artwork, commissioned the extras, put it in a set and said, this is what fans are going to get. So, I mean, you, you're you the final line, are you? When when it's all put together, that's you're like, 
this is what I want for people to have when they take home. Yeah, I mean, it is done to some degree in consultation uh, with the other producers. You know, you, we brainstorm ideas off each other. Um, I, with the Battle Royale one, I guess the, I mean, the, the goal is always to do the best ever release you can at that time. So that no one's going to even bother to do it because, I mean, now we're getting UHD. Uh, is there going to be a time in five years' time when people are going to have an 8K format? I don't think so, really. So I think this is going to be the last ever release, maybe. Yes. I don't yeah. know. The one thing I would say with Battle Royale, I realised, of course, that there was uh, Battle Royale was reissued in 2009 in a 3D version. So we, we did miss that <laughs> off Battle Royale 3D. So I don't know, maybe that might be something <laughs> <in the> future. <laughs> I think that would be would Arrow's be first 3D release. <laughs> Although it is, yeah, there are titles coming up that might, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'll I, I I tell you what, what impressed me most with the, I mean, all the stuff, Kaz, you said about the Battle Royale set is absolute meat and potatoes. But for me, it was all the stuff which, it was the ephemera, the tat, if you like. It was the <laughs> playing cards. I mean, yeah. I mean that was. I, the that, thing don't for even me. go there with the playing cards. <laughs> I was, um, that was like uh, my uh, mentor, should we say, Kevin Lambert, uh, when when we um, started off, and and uh, I can't even remember how the thing came up. <laughs> Why don't we do battle royale trump cards? And then it was like a case of Brilliant. I literally spent months trying to work out a design for the bots, how it was going to fit in. We kept on getting all this packaging and the, and explaining to the people who were making the packaging how this was going to work. They'd originally designed these playing cards that were like the size of a postcard and sort of something <laughs> like that. But yeah, it, it almost drove me mad, you know, <laughs> the way the well, card well, folded together. Well, 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 it was my favourite bit of the entire thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> well worth it. Did, did anyone actually play the game? I mean... It, i i i have not i mean i i will say that unfortunately when i when you get stuff to review you generally only get the discs yeah no, so it's a... because i reviewed it mark's the one who ended up with the finished it's, copy it... no, i bought it myself <laughs> yeah i'm copy. saying i bought he's... it myself yeah. you... <laughs> yes. Honestly, you, ended, you ended up with the finished copy because you it's spent over, money on it it's so, over yeah. there i think there it is no i mean i mean I, every time i sort of you know say to the the wife and daughter I've got a game for us to play on games night. They they just they like shake, shake their Trump. heads at me. <laughs> so, so unfortunately, no, I haven't yet played it, Jasper. I have this idea. I'm glad I didn't follow it through as well. But with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, that when the film oh. came out, there was some old, uh, it might have been on the Commodore 64, one of these old sort of gaming consoles. There was like a, a, a tie-in game. And I thought, is there a way I can somehow license this from Sony and stick it so you can play play oh. this crappy platform game with it with a sort of DVD handset? <laughs> but then I thought, no, that's we're not going to go down that way. That's just oh, that would have been great. <laughs> I mean, if if I could ask for any uh, Japanese flavored releases, I would want all of the other Takashi Katano films. 115 forever. film box set <laughs> no he's only he's only done like i don't know a dozen films it wouldn't it wouldn't be hard to put all of his films together uh, i know that i know they're not licensed on blu-ray to arrow but if, if no well got... i mean third window we've got a lot of them bfi mm, yes. got some. um yeah but but a 4k release nab them for 4k oh yeah yeah that's the, the, it would be yeah. really good like sonatine or you know would it would be something special yeah but but yes that would be that would be my my go-to although if i've I'm, got them all at the moment unfortunately yeah they're probably just going to sit on them but um <laughs> so so obviously a lot of these a lot of these are a labor of love you put a lot into them you're working oh, on no, a I, get, I get paid for it you know, so no i know <laughs> i i understand but easy to be in love with it you know? <laughs> But but at the end of the day, we're a very internet driven um, society in this day and age. So you release this box set where the people who put put together the box set didn't take into account the shape of the cards or how it fits together. There's going to be someone on there who says, oh, I can't get the discs out. There's going to be someone on there who says, oh, yeah, I didn't like this scene at scene 
one hour 56 where the light flash flashes for a second how how do you get on with uh the fact that there is a lot of passion and love for these releases mm. but there are also you know microcosms of internet communities who get very anal about tiny little things and and they range i don't get me wrong there have been you know other releases across the board which have have had to be reissued but i mean there are also some you know why didn't i get this interview that was available in 1999 mm -hmm. ported over to my disc why couldn't they be bothered to do that how, how does that go is that water off a duck's back or is it no, it's, it's not water off a duck's back. I mean, I would say with the example is in the Battle Royale, I mean, we, we had God knows how many hours worth of, of legacy sort of um, interviews and on set sort of behind the scenes making of stuff like hours, literally. And um, that's all got to be, you know, there are subtitles for some of them, but they generally need reworking. And then that all needs um, QCing uh and you know it's a lot of work for from a lot of people a lot of people all work together and inevitably stuff gets goes missing i mean like you know the battle royale had like a hundred page book in it as well yeah um so things do go and it's sort of you kick yourself when it happens it's some some it's some things just feel like nitpicking and others don't i mean i'm in two sides of it because you know i i grew up watching um you know, films on God knows nth generation dupes. And there were some films I remember, like I talking of the awe and encyclopedia of horror. I remember in, in when I was 17 seeing a still of a film called Blind Beast and going, oh, I really want to see that. And literally spent 15 years trying to see this film. And uh, now it's like produced a Blu ray mm. for it. So <clears throat> I think, you know, I, the stuff that's available to us now for a film fan it's amazing and and the quality it's available for us in general so i think it's like when people nitpick a bit over the color grade i was like is it really important or do you want to watch the film but i do also understand that we need to have the best quad you know you want to see it in the best condition ever you can do yeah yeah it's a, tri um, it's a, it's a tricky line isn't it it's it's and I think the thing, the thing for me is that there's, there's so little frame of reference for a lot of this stuff. Well, it's, mm. it, it, it's different from the last release. Well, the last release might have been different from the release before that. And it's it's almost as a case of at some point it feels like it's eating its own tail, this entire sort of spiral down. But it has led to some uh, to some genuine, I think, errors being spotted and you know yeah. better quality products being put out. So I think, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I mean, there's when you get the other side where you've got stuff like earlier this year, um, the Sonny Chiba, The Executioner, the two films there. I mean, they've never really been released in high def on, on home video. Um, and there might be complaints. I mean, there were films with mono audio where we're getting the the masters off mm. um, Toei. And if the audio pops and isn't brilliant, you know, it's a film that was made 50 years ago, ultimately. So it's yeah. just you... you you can only do so much with the elements that you're given. Mm. Yes. Uh, oh, and, and would you ever in that case, or, or have you ever sort of got a title like that, looked at, at the materials and gone, do you know what? We, we, we don't want to put this out because it, it, it's not good enough. Uh, yeah, that's, that's generally not a decision that I would make yeah. but it, it's certainly a case that you know we get the lists and there's films that we would love to do and it's just like for various reasons licensing costs might be prohibitive yeah. um the the masters might not exist for it we don't maybe don't even know who the rights holder is in some cases you know it, it happens a lot that generally yeah. there's only so you know out of all the films that were ever made there's only so many that come up over and over again yeah and um some films, yeah, just might not have any commercial potential, really. You know, there's a lot of the stuff I like. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we talked about Battle Royale, but you also did the Grudge box set, the Jew on the mm, original mm. Jew on Grudge box set. And that, I mean, that's very niche as well. It's got all of the prequel sequels. No. And 
Well, no. it's got a lot. It's got of a the lot of prequel. them. Okay, sorry, Mark. Okay. <laughs> it's got a lot of the prequel <laughs> sequels, including ones which even you, Mark, found harder to watch. <laughs> but um, but I mean, it that was also a comprehensive collection. Mm. Um, I, I don't. Do do you go into these? I mean, I'm sidetracking a little bit, but do you go into these going? I've got one title, like a primary title, Battle Royale or The Grudge, but I'm going to produce a box set and include as much as I can in terms of sequels, prequels, additional material. Or do you go into it going, I'm going to release like six Grudge films in a box set with everything? I mean, are you aware up front that it's... Yeah, I mean that, that was that was a decision. They'd all been acquired as a package, so I I didn't have any right. decision on that. Um, I there are there are some examples, say, of Japanese serials in in the from the nineteen sixties. You know, you get the the long running Yakuza movie serials that go on for nine films. And it's like, oh, do we just release the first two, or do <laughs> we do the full nine? Or if if yeah. we can't do the full nine, what's the point of doing any of them? Mm. You know, so I guess that there is that sort of mindset i mean i that it is interesting because the grudge i i hadn't seen it since it came out and i remember actually i was living in tokyo when it came out and and i was not a huge fan of the film i learned to love them a lot more i actually really do i think they 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 are a lot better in hindsight i think i was just sick of jay horror at that time I don't know what it was, <laughs> yeah um but um <clears throat> I think they're great films, but I mean, I think it's just like if you're going to have the one, you might as well do the the other. I mean, I think for historical purposes, the, the video ones are really interesting. Mm. And also even I think the first year one film had been released on Blu-ray, but the second one hadn't. Forgive me if I'm wrong here. It would be long. It had been on DVD oh. or something. Yeah. And it's very easy to go, oh, well, you know, First one's great, the second one's not, or whatever. But I actually think the second year one's actually really interesting. I mean, it's the same with the um, yeah. the Ring box set. I mean, I'm always a big fan of the original Ring um, films. I've always been a champion of Spiral, Razen, um, mm -hmm. That I didn't work on that, but I actually wrote the booklet essay for, for Razen and um, will say it's trying to do something very different from what, you know, the Ring is doing, but it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't make it a lesser film necessarily. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the Duon box set, box set was really interesting because of that, not just the variety of the films, but like you said, you've got two that were shot on SD video. You've mm. got one which has got a beautiful new 4K restoration on mm. a brand new UH. And then you've got, you know, the sequel wasn't on 4K. It's a regular 1080p. And then the latter two are shot on digital. So you've got such a variety. I mean, that must be uh, almost a headache for the technical people to go, oh my word, how do we try and... Oh, they, they, yes, kind of it was a headache trying to actually make um, literally video shot material look good on, on yeah. a... You know, it's the thing is we've all got 5K screens now, haven't we? So it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How to make it not too obviously sort of um, mm. muddy, yeah. No, but I, but I thought, I mean, obviously, the, you know, the first thought a lot of people had was, oh, if only there'd, there'd been more films in there. But then, of course, you, you're into the rights things. You're into the fact that all the sequels were produced by different companies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, these, and, these and, are the, the ones that Shimizu himself yeah. was. I mean, I remember yeah. when I approached Shimizu to do the interview and he said, can I just check it hasn't got any of the the later ones on them because if it has i'm not being involved sort of thing oh that's so, interesting yeah. ah. <laughs> but, but 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 again i mean i i think it for, for me it, it it signified almost a a sort of change in tack from from arrow in terms of the box sets that it was willing to to almost spread its wings a little bit more and and, and embrace the the different quality the different variety and i think it bodes well for for future series releases, I think. Well, I hope it does. But mm. yeah, it was, it was a fantastic box set. That I think I reviewed it for the site and gave it very good marks. Oh, great! <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Talking yeah. about future releases, mm. can you give us any teases about what uh, you're currently working on, or 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 what you've 
what you've got in on your radar or well i've, I've what had a bit of give us what are you yeah i've had a bit of a glut of stuff that i had to finish up at the end of last year so i'm just sort of trying to remember it so yeah the street fighter trilogy mm. um the you know that that's a uk only release but um you know proper releases uh you know with as many extras as we could put in there um assassination bureau and lovers lane the old forgotten mm. uh yeah you know, I mean, that's an interesting about Lovers Lane as well. I mean, we're, we're looking back at stuff like this. That was a film that was originally made. I mean, it was yeah, it was made straight for video. It, I mean, it, it, that was the intended market. I'm sure if they could have got a theatrical release, they'd have gone with it. But um, what you were talking about with the uh, Jew one is that we're we're now at a stage where we can look back at say the the 90s when there were films made being made directly for video on a variety of formats. And you have to embrace whatever technology was used to film them at the time. I mean, you've got to think about all these, you know, straight to video. I mean, video shot films in the 2000s were all filmed in SD. So there's no point doing, you know, I mean, you can do UHD releases there, but you need a lot of work to, to make them look. You, you can't. Mm. There's only so much you can no, do. Absolutely. Mm. But I think it's important that, you know, these as a boutique label, you're, you're working as an archivist essentially you're, you're a curator you're putting together the best possible version you can with the best possible contextual material and so i think if if there are wild variations of formats i mean you have to explain why it's like that which is what james the two jameses of the tech team obviously do when they write the notes for the for the booklet um but you know you can't if people complain that i don't know it's like complaining something's in black and white, isn't it? Or I don't, it's, you... <laughs> yeah, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. Mm. Uh, mm. And and I, sp I suppose sort of to to start wrapping this up, then, what's your mm. view on on the current state of the physical media market? Then, obviously, it's been it, it's a mature market, but it's ever changing. The advent of 4K just in the last couple of years, we've seen an interesting move from major Hollywood studios letting the boutiques take some of their, you know, to be blunt, prestige titles off their hands and put them out. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the rise of digital and, and Arrow themselves are, are, are quite vociferous in that area. You've got the Arrow streaming channel, but they also put out very cheap you know digital purchases of films as well uh so in term, in terms of this this landscape where physical media media finds itself what's your thought on on where it's at currently from where it's been and potentially where it's going well i when i started writing um midnight eye that was largely you know the the interest in asian cinema and world cinema in general came from two factors which was the growth of the internet and the growth of dvd where you could get english subtitled films and, and order them off ebay and get something sent over from hong kong um so i would sort of been involved I, I thought dvd was a very revolutionary format in that technique and you had an explosion of stuff coming out in in the 2000s uh not all of it particularly good quality in terms of the quality of the masters uh or in terms of the films you know <laughs> but you know i remember you probably about you know back in the heyday of hmv and you'd go in there and see like people with shopping baskets going oh i'm going to get my weekends viewing sorted and just doing that three for a tenner and just throwing stuff in um and I, I'm i sort of glad that that, I, I mean, you know, when, a lot of the time I tell people I work for a Blu-ray company, you know, just normal Joe Schmoes in the street, they're going, do people still buy Blu-rays? <laughs> go, yeah, of course they do. And I, and I think it is a really healthy state because mm. people are still continuing to pick up stuff. Um, I mean, I hope it doesn't get to the stage where we're reissuing the same old mm. films over and over again yeah. in, in higher quality things. I mean, I've, I've inherited some titles which have been released many times, and it's a case of what more do you do for extras? You know, that you can't just have the say the director's commentary of you know, and again like the 2023 version. Uh, but I, I 
think certainly in terms of what you're saying about the Hollywood licenses, there's a lot of stuff. I've got a particular prestige title I'm working on at the moment, but I've also got a really interesting British film that uh, hasn't ever been on home video, but people might remember it from uh, being on TV a lot in the 80s, but a film from the 70s, uh, which I'm having a great amount of fun with at the moment. I wish I could tell you more about it. Uh, <laughs> but I'll just leave that one hanging. Yeah, <laughs> enough of a clue for us to go up and Google. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the sort of thing. I mean, I think in terms of the... Japanese stuff. I I hope there's a market to support it. I mean, I know that some of the titles don't always sell. They, I mean, they they never lose money. There, there's a, a yeah. an audience that will keep the keep things profitable. Work, but it's not the same as you know when I I worked on the UHD of Wild Things and that sold like wildfire. I mean, it's just yeah. it's done really well. So I I yeah, as long as there's new titles coming into the mm. public discussion group. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's interesting that, that in terms of um, the canon of, of world cinema at the moment, how, uh, say, the, the recent Sight and Sound uh, top 100, there's a lot of discussion and criticism and everything about it, but it was shaped by a new generation of viewers who weren't going around watching these films in art house cinemas in repertory yeah. cinemas or, or yeah. learning through stuff mm. i mean that they were learning by whatever criterion had put out or, or what arrow were putting out or what was yeah. being taught in film courses so i think availability is really crucial to that mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely uh and, and i think i think for me the i i've got to a point where i i will always be a physical media person i mean this is this is a, a third of what i've got you know, this is all i'm allowed out in this room don't tell the wife uh but but what but what i've found is is that uh, with the advent of digital and certainly what arrow are doing with digital mm -hmm. i'm actually being introduced to a wider variety of titles you know on, on a monday morning with itunes when i check the sales if there is a title that i'm a little bit hesitant of or i'm not too sure about it I will pick it up cheaper on digital as a taster, if you like, mm. almost view it as a rental. I did it with Blind Beast. I did it with the Dimagin. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. Dimagin, yeah. The Dimagin trilogy. I, bu I bought the first one of that digitally, and the week after I went straight out and bought the box set. And, yeah. I, and, I, and, and I think as long as we can use sort of the two sides of, of the home media market like that, I, th I think it, they will feed each other. And I think it will be it will continue to drive exactly like you said, wider interest in more titles. So mm. fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, well, the Dimatch one's a good point of view because you know it's it's the films are really only a small part of that package almost. Mm. I think we've got that massive big booklet in there, which yeah. was great sort of fun to put together. Um, and all the extras around the making of the film. So Definitely, I think, yeah, physical media can do that. I mean, there perhaps are some films that aren't suited to that, but there are plenty of others that are really rewarding to do in that way. Superb. I feel like I've got a demand that Arrow send me out the actual booklet with the check discs when I'm reviewing, because I'm really <laughs> missing out on some of this stuff. You know? Yeah, this uh, something is a bit of a bone of contention for me. I I think the booklet should go out. Uh, yeah, it's, it sounds like it should. Even really. the PDF, you know, it's just yeah. I think. Yeah. Yes, I think that. I mean, I I say from the other side of the point of view, in that before I became a producer, Arrow, I was like writing the booklets um, for quite a lot of releases. Yeah. So it was always a case when the reviews came out, it's like no one mentioned anything about my booklet, and it's just because no one had read it. So it's almost yeah. like your contribution has sort of been ignored. I don't know. Mm. Well, I, th I think don't Arrow make the booklets available as PDFs on their website? Did I, have I got that wrong? I'm going to check that. I'm, I'm sure. I you, some... might, you might be right, actually. I should know yeah. about this. I? <laughs> I should, I, so should I. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I think, yeah. I think but, but uh, and and it's it is it's so, so much of that added value I think gets lost in the you know when the big studios put out 
tat versions mm. it feels like tat but i think when the <laughs> boutiques do it you know yourself uh radiant criterion you know the those booklets have got such fascinating and it's the variety of the writing in them as well it's not just here's a critique of the film it's old reviews it it's bios of of the creators that are involved and i think it, it really does add to the the whole the physical media purchase so much mm. i've Excellent. got one last question on this yeah. i would love to know what whether or not arrow have the license to them or not what would be your just a couple of your favorite films that you would love to produce like on on disc that haven't been produced on disc well uh in terms of japanese cinema i've, I've got sure. yeah. quite quite um one of my favorite films this is like it's called shall we dance uh and it's like a comedy the ballroom comedy it so really be, yeah and 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 I've been told that this sort of thing is it was remade with Richard Gere and Jayla. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's it was released by Miramax in, in the mid nineties and was one of the top grossing Asian films. Well, it was the top grossing Asian film in America of all time at the time. Um oh, and wow. but now it's sort of faded out of the limelight. But it's just hilarious and it's it's funny and it's it's moving. Um I I'm not sure if there's the market i mean it's funny because like i say it's like people will buy i don't know what to say without tapping myself but you know <laughs> any sort of red grade horror movie um on a uhd <laughs> but like quality films you know uh, uh, are a tougher self because yeah. <laughs> but i think yeah, there's yeah. there's lots of films like that from 80s japan uh, where the rights are quite difficult. I mean, another one called Family Game is a brilliant film. Um, but my my big frustration, one of my favourite films of all time is Lynn Ramsey's Morgan Color. And yes, I think yeah. it's terrible we haven't got a, a, a DVD, a Blu-ray of that in the UK. Um, I can't believe it. Um, and that would be a, a dream project. Okay. Actually, not even a dream project. I just want want it out there. I'd rather not work on it myself. I'd probably ruin it. But uh, just, <laughs> just just someone put it out, please. Yes. Yeah, it does feel like that. Like when I talk to you about the Katani films and you tell me all the people who own them, it's like, put them out there, stick them on 4K, you know, <laughs> give, me, give me access to them. Then. <laughs> because that's the other aspect, isn't it? Whether it's Arrow, or whether it's Criterion, or whoever has the license. That doesn't mean you'll see the disc anytime soon. So um Yeah. I can think of all manner of Japanese films and Japanese film directors uh that um probably will never get released on Blu-ray just because they're not names. Yeah. So I feel I feel happy that we're doing stuff like the Tomo Uchida and and the um Masamura stuff like Blind Beast. Mm. Yeah. No, it's very, very nice work. Well, it has been tremendous speaking to you and well, getting some insight into to what you do at Arrow and what Arrow do. And um, I think that it's opened our eyes to a, a lot of different things. Um, I very much appreciate you taking the time. Yes, thank you, Jasper. Well, thank you for asking me. It's been a, a pleasure. <laughs>